This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Peterson, Massa Martana, Italy. A Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 21 An Air Scout for Zodanga. As I proceeded on my journey toward Zodanga, many strange and interesting sights arrested my attention, and at the several farmhouses where I stopped I learned a number of new and instructive things concerning the methods and manners of Barsoom. The water which supplies the farms of Mars is collected in immense underground reservoirs at either pole from the mount melting ice caps, and pumped through long conduits to the various populated centers. Along either side of these conduits, and extending their entire length, lie the cultivated districts. These are divided into tracts of about the same size, each tract being under the supervision of one or more government officers. Instead of flooding the surface of the fields, and thus wasting immense quantities of water by evaporation, the precious liquid is carried underground through a vast network of small pipes directly to the roots of the vegetation. The crops upon Mars are always uniform, for there are no droughts, no rains, no high winds, and no insects or destroying birds. On this trip I tasted the first meat I had eaten since leaving Earth, large, juicy steaks and chops from the well-fed domestic animals of the farms. Also I enjoyed luscious fruits and vegetables, but not a single article of food which was exactly similar to anything on Earth. Every plant and flower and vegetable and animal has been so refined by ages of careful scientific cultivation and breeding that the like of them on earth dwindled into pale, gray, characterless nothingness by comparison. At a second stop I met some highly cultivated people of the noble class, and while in conversation we chanced to speak of helium. One of the older men had been there on a diplomatic mission several years before, and spoke with regret of the conditions which seemed destined ever to keep those two countries at war. Helium, he said, rightly boasts the most beautiful women of Barsoom, and of all her treasures the wondrous daughter of Mors Karjak, Deja Thoris, is the most exquisite flower. Why, he added, the people really worship the ground she walks upon, and since her loss on that ill-starred expedition all helium has been draped in mourning. That our ruler should have attacked the disabled fleet as it was returning to helium was but another of his awful blunders, which I fear will sooner or later compel Zodanga to elevate a wiser man to his place. Even now, Though our victorious armies are surrounding Helium, the people of Zodanga are voicing their displeasure, for the war is not a popular one, since it is not based on right or justice. Our forces took advantage of the absence of the principal fleet of Helium on their search for the princess, and so we have been able easily to reduce the city to a sorry plight. It is said she will fall within the next few passages of the further moon." And what, think you, may have been the fate of the princess, Deja Thoris? I asked as casually as possible. She is dead, he answered. This much was learned from a green warrior recently captured by our forces in the south. She escaped from the hordes of Thark with a strange creature of another world, only to fall into the hands of the war hoons. Their thoats were found wandering upon the sea-bottom, and evidences of a bloody conflict were discovered nearby. While this information was in no way reassuring, neither was it at all conclusive proof of the death of Deja Thoris, and so I determined to make every effort possible to reach Helium as quickly as I could, and carry to Tardos Moore such news of his granddaughter's possible whereabouts as lay in my power. Ten days after leaving the three Tor brothers, I arrived at Zodanga. 
From the moment that I had come in contact with the red inhabitants of Mars, I had noticed that Wula drew a great amount of unwelcome attention to me, since the huge brute belonged to a species which is never domesticated by the red men. Were one to stroll down Broadway with a Numidian lion at his heels, the effect would be somewhat similar to that which I should have produced had I entered Zodanga with Wula. The very thought of parting with a faithful fellow caused me so great regret and genuine sorrow that I put it off until just before we arrived at the city's gates, but then finally it became imperative that we separate. Had nothing further than my own safety or pleasure been at stake, no argument could have prevailed upon me to turn away the one creature upon Barsoom that had never failed in a demonstration of affection and loyalty. But as I would willingly have offered my life in the service of her in search of whom I was about to challenge the unknown dangers of this, to me, mysterious city, I could not permit even Wula's life to threaten the success of my venture, much less his momentary happiness, for I doubted not he would soon forget me. And so I bade the poor beast an affectionate farewell, promising him, however, that if I came through my adventure in safety, that in some way I should find the means to search him out. He seemed to understand me fully, and when I pointed back in the direction of Thark, he turned sorrowfully away, nor could I bear to watch him go, but resolutely set my face toward Zodanga, and with a touch of heart-sickness approached her frowning walls. The letter I bore from them gave to me immediate entrance to the vast walled city. It was still very early in the morning, and the streets were practically deserted. The residences, raised high upon their metal columns, resembled huge rookeries, while the uprights themselves presented the appearance of steel tree trunks. The shops, as a rule, were not raised from the ground, nor were their doors bolted or barred, since thievery is practically unknown upon Barsoom. Assassination is the ever-present fear of all Barsoomians, and for this reason alone their homes are raised high above the ground at night, or in times of danger. The Tor brothers had given me explicit directions for reaching the point of the city where I could find living accommodations and be near the offices of the government agents to whom they had given me letters. My way led to the central square or plaza, which is a characteristic of all Martian cities. The plaza of Zodanga covers a square mile, and is bounded by the palaces of the Jeddak, the Jeds, and the other members of royalty and nobility of Zodanga, as well as by the principal public buildings, cafes, and shops. As I was crossing the great square, lost in wonder and admiration of the magnificent architecture and the gorgeous scarlet vegetation which carpeted the broad lawns, I discovered a red Martian walking briskly toward me from one of the avenues. He paid not the slightest attention to me, but as he came abreast I recognized him, and turning I placed my hand upon his shoulder, calling out, Kaor, Gantos come! Like lightning he wheeled, and before I, I could so much as lower my hand, the point of his long-sword was at my breast. "'Who are you?' he growled, and then as a backward leap carried me fifty feet from his sword, he dropped the point to the ground and exclaimed, laughing, "'I do not need a better reply. There is but one man upon all Barsoom who can bounce about like a rubber ball. By the mother of the further moon, John Carter, how came you here, and have you become a Darcene that you can change your color at will?' "'You gave me a bad half-minute, my friend,' he continued, after I had briefly outlined my adventures since parting with him in the arena at Warhoom. "'Were my name and city known to the Zodangans, I would shortly be sitting on the banks of the lost sea of Chorus with my revered and departed ancestors. I am here in the interest of Tardos Mors, Jeddak of Helium, to discover the whereabouts of Deja Thoris, our princess.' Sab Than, prince of Zodanga, has her hidden in the city, and has fallen madly in love with her. His father, Than Kosis, Jeddak of Zodanga, has made her voluntary marriage to his son, the price of peace between our countries. But Tardos Mors will not accede to the demands, and has sent word that he and his people would rather look upon the dead face of their princess than see her wed to any than her own choice, and that personally he would prefer being engulfed in the ashes of a lost and burning helium to joining the metal of his house with that of Thancosis. 
His reply was the deadliest affront he could have put upon Thancosis and the Zodangans, but his people love him the more for it, and his strength in helium is greater to-day than ever. "'I have been here three days,' continued Kantos Khan, "'but I have not yet found where Dejah Thoris is imprisoned. "'Today I joined the Zodangan navy as an air scout, "'and I hope in this way to win the confidence of Sab Than, the prince, "'who is commander of this division of the navy, "'and thus learn the whereabouts of Dejah Thoris. "'I am glad that you are here, John Carter, "'for I know your loyalty to my princess, "'and two of us working together should be able to accomplish much.' The plaza was now commencing to fill with people going and coming upon the daily activities of their duties. The shops were opening, and the cafes filling with early morning patrons. Kantos Khan led me to one of those gorgeous eating places where we were served entirely by mechanical apparatus. No hand touched the food from the time it entered the building in its raw state until it emerged hot and delicious upon the tables before the guests, in response to the touching of tiny buttons to indicate their desires. After our meal, Kantos Khan took me with him to the headquarters of the Air Scout Squadron, and introducing me to his superior, asked that I be enrolled as a member of the Corps. In accordance with a custom, an examination was necessary, but Kantos Khan had told me to have no fear on this score, as he would attend to that part of the matter. He accomplished this by taking my order for examination to the examining officer, and representing himself as John Carter. "'This ruse will be discovered later,' he cheerfully explained, "'when they check up my weights, measurements, and other personal identification data, "'but it will be several months before this is done, "'and our mission should be accomplished, or have failed, long before that.' "'The next few days were spent by Kantos Khan "'in teaching me the intricacies of flying "'and of repairing the dainty little contrivances "'which the Martians used for this purpose.' The body of the one-man aircraft is about sixteen feet long, two feet wide, and three inches thick, tapering to a point at each end. The driver sits on top of this plane upon a seat constructed over the small, noiseless, radium engine which propels it. The medium of buoyancy is contained within the thin metal walls of the body, and consists of the eighth barsoomium ray or ray of propulsion, as it may be termed in view of its properties. This ray, like the ninth ray, is unknown on earth, but the Martians have discovered that it is an inherent property of all light, no matter from what source it emanates. They have learned that it is the solar eighth ray which propels the light of the sun to the various planets, and that it is the individual eighth ray of each planet which reflects or propels the light thus obtained out into space once more. The solar eighth ray would be absorbed by the surface of Barsoom, but the Barsoomium eighth ray, which tends to propel light from Mars into space, is constantly streaming out from the planet, constituting a force of repulsion of gravity, which, when confined, is able to lift enormous weights from the surface of the ground. It is this ray which has enabled them to so perfect aviation that battleships far outweighing anything known upon earth sail as gracefully and lightly through the thin air of Barsoom as a toy balloon in the heavy atmosphere of earth. During the early years of the discovery of this ray, many strange accidents occurred before the Martians learned to measure and control the wonderful power they had found. In one instance, some nine hundred years before, the first great battleship to be built with eighth-ray reservoirs was stored with too great a quantity of the rays, and she had sailed up from helium with five hundred officers and men, never to return. Her power of repulsion for the planet was so great that it had carried her far into space, where she can be seen today, by the aid of powerful telescopes, hurtling through the heavens ten thousand miles from Mars, a tiny satellite that will thus encircle Barsoom to the end of time. The fourth day after my arrival at Zodanga I made my first flight, and as a result of it I won a promotion which included quarters in the palace of Thancosis. As I rose above the city I circled several times, as I had seen Kantos Khan do, and then throwing my engine into top speed, I raced at terrific velocity toward the south, following one of the great waterways which enters Zodanga from that direction. 
I had traversed perhaps two hundred miles in a little less than an hour, when I descried far below me a party of three green warriors racing madly toward a small figure on foot, which seemed to be trying to reach the confines of one of the walled fields. Dropping my machine rapidly toward them, and circling to the rear of the warriors, I soon saw that the object of their pursuit was a red Martian wearing the medal of the scout squadron to which I was attached. A short distance away lie his tiny flyer, surrounded by the tools with which he had evidently been occupied in repairing some damage when surprised by the green warriors. They were almost upon him now, their flying mounts charging down on the relatively puny figure at terrific speed, while the warriors leaned low to the right with their great metal-shod spears. Each seemed striving to be the first to impale the poor Zodangan, and in another moment his fate would have been sealed had it not been for my timely arrival. Driving my fleet aircraft at high speed directly behind the warriors, I soon overtook them, and without diminishing speed I rammed the prow of my little flyer between the sh shoulders of the nearest. The impact sufficient to have torn through inches of solid steel hurled the fellow's headless body into the air over the head of his throat, where it fell sprawling upon the moss. The mounts of the other two warriors turned, squealing in terror, and bolted in opposite directions. Reducing my speed, I circled, and came to the ground at the feet of the astonished Zodangan. He was warm in his thanks for my timely aid, and promised that my day's work would bring the reward it merited, for it was none other than the cousin of the Jeddak of Zodanga whose life I had saved. We wasted no time in talk, as we knew that the warriors would surely return as soon as they had gained control of their mounts. Hastening to his damaged machine, we were bending every effort to finish the needed repairs, and had almost completed them when we saw two green monsters returning at top speed from the opposite sides of us. When they had approached within a hundred yards, their thoughts again became unmanageable, and absolutely refused to advance further toward the aircraft which had frightened them. The warriors finally dismounted and, hobbling their animals, advanced toward us on foot with drawn long-swords. I advanced to meet the larger, telling the Zodangan to do the best he could with the other, finishing my man with almost no effort, as had now from much practice become habitual with me. I hastened to return to my new acquaintance, whom I found indeed in desperate straits. He was wounded and down, with the huge foot of his antagonist upon his throat, and the great longsword raised to deal the final thrust. With a bound I cleared the fifty feet intervening between us, and with an outstretched point drove my sword completely through the body of the green warrior. His sword fell, harmless, to the ground, and he sank limply upon the prostrate form of the Zodangan. A cursory examination of the latter revealed no mortal injuries, and after a brief rest he asserted that he felt fit to attempt the return voyage. He would have to pilot his own craft, however, as these frail vessels are not intended to convey but a single person. Quickly completing the repairs, we rose together into the still, cloudless Martian sky, and at great speed, and without further mishap, returned to Zodanga. As we neared the city, we discovered a mighty concourse of civilians and troops assembled upon the plain before the city. The sky was black with naval vessels and private and public pleasure craft, flying long streamers of gay-colored silks, and banners and flags of odd and picturesque design. My companion signaled that I slow down, and running his machine close beside mine, suggested that we approach and watch the ceremony which, he said, was for the purpose of conferring honors on individual officers and men for bravery and other distinguished service. He then unfurled a little ensign which denoted that his craft bore a member of the royal family of Zodanga, and together we made our way through the maze of low-flying air vessels until we hung directly over the jeddak of Zodanga and his staff. All were mounted upon the small domestic bull thoats of the Red Martians, and their trappings and ornamentation bore such a quantity of gorgeously colored feathers that I could not but be struck with the startling resemblance the concourse bore to a band of the Red Indians of my own earth. One of the staff called the attention of Thancosis to the presence of my companion above them, and the ruler motioned for him to descend. 
As they waited for the troops to move into position facing the Jeddak, the two talked earnestly together, the Jeddak and his staff occasionally glancing up at me. I could not hear their conversation, and presently it ceased and all dismounted, as the last body of troops had wheeled into position before their emperor. A member of the staff advanced toward the troops, and calling the name of his soldier, commanded him to advance. The officer then recited the nature of the heroic act which had won the approval of the Jeddak, and the later advanced and placed a metal ornament upon the left arm of the lucky man. Ten men had been so decorated when the aide called out, "'John Carter, Air Scout!' Never in my life had I been so surprised, but the habit of military discipline is strong within me, and I dropped my little machine lightly to the ground and advanced on foot as I had seen the others do. As I halted before the officer, he addressed me in a voice audible to the entire assemblage of troops and spectators. "'In recognition, John Carter,' he said, of your remarkable courage and skill in defending the person of the cousin of the Jeddak Thancosis, and, single-handed, vanquishing three green warriors, it is the pleasure of our Jeddak to confer on you the mark of his esteem. Thancosis then advanced toward me, and placing an ornament upon me, said, my cousin has narrated the details of your wonderful achievement, which seemed little short of miraculous, and if you can so well defend a cousin of the Jeddak, how much better you could defend the person of the Jeddak himself. You are therefore appointed a padwar of the guards, and will be quartered in my palace hereafter. I thanked him, and at his direction joined the members of his staff. After the ceremony, I returned my machine to its quarters on the roofs of the barracks of the Air Scout Squadron, and with an orderly from the palace to guide me, I reported to the officer in charge of the palace. End of chapter 21